So now what are some specific recommendations for English learners? So the most important thing in thinking about serving English learners is that you can't use the same approaches. We're not trying to find different assessments that will put students into the same program we've always offered. Uh, so some of the things you might think about is differentiation and thinking about students' readiness for additional challenge and their needs in, um, in learning in their current situation. So English learners, of course, are learning English. <laughs> it's right in the title. Um, it's very important that we understand their ability to learn uh, language and to make sense of language, identify the students who will learn English more quickly than others, and identify students who need more support to learn English. So um, I like to talk about aptitude in terms of puzzle pieces, so it's the fit between the individual and the situation. Uh, so aptitude is not something the student just has always, but it's something about the situation. So for an English learner, their school context is partly defined by the typical academics that everyone else is encountering, but also by the, the language that they're having to acquire. So we need to think about the needs of those students in the classroom being different from others. Uh, so some of the opportunities for these students. Um, one is something um, more like in-class differentiation. So um, basically increasing the size and variety of programs you're going to offer. So English learner students, no matter how you identify them, won't necessarily be ready for the same kinds of um, enrichment and gifted programming that other students are ready for because of that language barrier. Uh, so one opportunity is to provide enrichment in the regular classroom. So giving those students opportunities to develop talents and to demonstrate talents to their teachers, um, even if they're not ready for the programming that you offer, that may be a pull-out program that's very heavily verbally loaded or um, has other demands that aren't appropriate for them at this time. So you definitely want to serve these students, but be creative in the way that you do it. Uh, if you're going to use nonverbal tests with these students, again, remember that you're going to identify somewhat students with general reasoning abilities that are very strong, but also very much um, just abstract reasoning abilities that aren't related in any way to um, most areas of academic achievement. So you want to think about that. Um, and finally, you know, the people's first reaction is, oh, well, I shouldn't give the verbal test to an English learner. Absolutely, you should. It's, it's a paradox, but um, if you think about English learners, their number one task, again, is learning English. And so understanding their ability to, um, so verbal reasoning includes identifying unknown words, figuring out what the definition is, remembering those words more readily, and identifying patterns in language. And that's exactly what English learners need to be successful. They need to identify cognates with their home language. They need to be able to infer the meaning of unknown words and to make sense of partial information, partial verbal information. So it's actually really important to have that knowledge for English learners. Uh, but how do you interpret um, scores like TOGAT in a way that helps you understand their needs? And that's what I want to talk about now. Um, so one of the... Um, Automat, yeah, so this is basically what I was just saying. Basically, people want to eliminate verbal reasoning, um, but it's actually so important to um, academic domains anyway, but especially for English learners who are doing double the work. It's important to have those verbal measures. Uh, so one of our options is, again, the alt-verbal. So again, for K through two, if they're not a Spanish speaker, you can just eliminate the sentence completion test, and they will be able to take the full COGAT. Um, the directions have been translated into multiple different languages, and we're about to roll out even more languages with um, the audio option for computer-based administration. Uh, and there's opportunities if you have a local, um, if you have a translation expert and a, a language locally that's very, um, needs to be served, you can work with uh, the folks at Riverside on how to develop uh, other directions. So it's incredibly difficult and even inappropriate to translate test items on the fly, but test directions are much more amenable to translation. So if you need that, um, we're all very happy to work with you and make sure that students get the directions and understand what they're being asked to do on the COGAT. Um, so that's one option, is to reduce the language demands, but still measure verbal and quantitative and nonverbal reasoning. The second option is to use opportunity to learn norms. So this is very much aligned with that idea of um, the student in context. So if we're trying to identify the English learners who are going to learn English quickly or those who need more support, opportunity to learn norms can be very appropriate. Basically what you're doing is just looking at your test scores uh, in terms of local norms. So you're saying, you know, 
um, among all English learners locally who are have similar opportunities to learn, so the same number of years in the country, uh, maybe have the same number of years of formal instruction in their home country or other other variables. Anything you can use to make students more similar to each other when you're comparing test scores can be helpful. Um, basically what we've done here is just taken some scores of English learners in a school and we rank ordered them in terms of their raw performance on the verbal um, battery for COGAT. And if you look at their scale score, the standard age scale score, you'll see that even the highest performing student doesn't look that impressive, right? A 105, just above the national average. And you think, well, you know, the student's really not verbally gifted or they're not ready for additional challenge. They don't stand out. But in fact, when you look at them compared to other English learners, and especially if you could compile this data over multiple years, you'll find that um, some English learners stand out. They perform very well on COGAT type verbal tasks compared to other English learners. So you can't compare them to the national norms because those are students who were um, born in the US and are native English speakers. But comparing them to similar students, you can identify those who are learning English uh, most quickly and you can identify students who have especially strong verbal abilities. Likewise, you can identify the students with the weakest verbal abilities. And that's helpful for planning instruction for those students. Again, you might have an accelerated uh, ESL program or maybe a, a structure or tutoring for students who may struggle more. Um, so just looking at these students compared to other similar students can be very valuable in understanding their academic needs. And that would just be called opportunity to learn norms or local norms. And Dave Lohman and I have both um, published on this, and we'd be happy to share some resources around that, including Excel sheets that kind of do this. So how do you use information for English learners? Um, so first, we, we use the subgroup norms and say, uh, you know, that there's some students who are performing higher or lower compared to other students with similar opportunity to learn. So they learn English at a faster rate than other English learner students. Uh, as I mentioned before, it doesn't mean they're ready for the standard gifted, talented programs you may already have. It does mean they, they, they need services or differentiation. Um, so they have instructional needs, but they may not be ready for those programs. So, you know, think about the student holistically in terms of they have above average ability. What's their current skill, le skill level? What's their task interest and their creativity? All these things can combine to help you plan for instruction for these students in addition to ability information. Uh, so, in all of this, current achievement level needs to be your primary guide. Again, they're not ready for an accelerated ELA program if they're still acquiring English, but they may be ready for accelerated ESL or they may be ready for enrichment in the regular classroom to keep them from getting bored. Uh, the programming goal, encourage their interest and keep them motivated and engaged in school. Uh, if they are on or below grade level achievement, then you need to provide that structure for the students and again, maintain their motivation because it's very uh, frustrating to be an English learner in the classroom. So um, building that motivational component, that resilience and that engagement in the academic classroom is very important. And when they do have achievement that's in advance of peers, you know, a lot of times we see um, English learners who have very strong math performance, you know, consider su uh, single subject acceleration and possibly support them so you can kind of structure their engagement and advanced content while not having enough English maybe to fully understand um, the lecture or the textbook in that math class. So there's ways of accommodating that. Uh, 